Good morning, Sova Squad. It's me, Paul, with Reporting Live from my Sova. How's it going today? It is Monday morning when I'm filming this very early. As you can still see, it's a little dewy outside. And we are starting a new case this week. This one brings a lot of information. This is going to be interesting. Uh, we're going to learn some new things about farm equipment in this one, if that sounds intriguing to you. So go ahead and grab your coffee, and without further ado, let's review. Okay, so, like I said, this case caught my interest because it uses, you know, kind of bizarre farm equipment in it. There's affairs, there's betrayal, all the little things here that make a Sunday afternoon episode of, uh, you know, one of these crime shows that we like to watch. So, that being said, let's jump into it. Now, before we get started, I got most of this information from the police records and affidavit. Uh, so, that's where this is coming from. And I always like to say I'm not the end-all, be-all in this information. If you have information about this you want to share, drop it like it's hot in the comments. I welcome that. That's why I do these videos. I love learning more about this. So, we're going to be talking today about the case against Todd Michael Mullis. He was a 42-year-old man in Earlville, Michigan. He's been charged with murder in the first degree uh, against his wife, Amy Mullis. Now, they married uh, approximately around 2004, and they had three children together, and they lived in the town of Oroville. Now, on November 10th, 2018, around 12 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, 911 dispatcher received a phone call from Todd in regards to his wife, Amy. Now, this is what Todd's story was. He says that him, he, his wife, Amy, and his 13-year-old son were working in the North Hog building that day. They, they were farmers. They had a big farm, and so they're out there working. Now, apparently, Amy had had surgery like a couple of days before, so this is like her first day really getting out, and so she was doing what sounded to me kind of like light work. She was clean, like cleaning some light fixtures, things like that, and Todd said that he noticed she, she just wasn't feeling okay. She acted a little dizzy, and so he was like, look, you know, put everything down. Just go. You need to go rest, and he was like, on your way back to the house, stop at, I guess there's another shed. There's lots of buildings on this property so he wanted her to stop at one of these sheds and get a pet carrier and leave it outside and then go inside and rest so he sent her on away and he and his son continued working so later on Todd and his son wanted to take a break grab a drink and so they went to the office that was in the building that they were working on and that's when Todd says that he noticed well the pet carrier wasn't there and it struck him as a little odd, so he sent his son to go check on his mother. Next thing you know, Todd hears his son yelling, Dad, 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 you know, come here, whatever. And so he runs up there, and he finds his wife, Amy, on the ground in, like, a fetal position, basically, with a corn rake impaled in her back. Now, before we go any further, let's pause and go over something drastically important, and that is... What is a corn rake? Okay, I looked this up, and we're going straight to the patent over this one, y'all. Uh, and so let's just go. I'm going to read this to you, and we're going to check it out. This invention relates to an ear corn rake with a special purpose of dislodging, loosening, and expeditiously raking packed and tangled ears of corn from a corn crib or pile to a conveyor drag or elsewhere as a step particularly convenient in shelling the corn. Essentially, my layman terms is is it's like a, a big fancy pitchfork that's made to pick up corn. Now, that being said, I was like, what is this? I have to look this up. So I Googled it. And y'all, when, when I Googled it, I don't know if it's my computer that's doing this, but it's like one picture comes up of the corn rake and then a bunch of pictures of him, of Todd Mullis, come up. So I was just like, okay, you know it's bad. When you Google a murder weapon and your picture comes up, like, go ahead and lawyer up. Whatever case you're involved in that point, it's time to get a lawyer because this is not good. So I looked at it, and to me, it just looks like a big pitchfork. It's very Friday the 13th Part 3, the scene in the garage. I've seen it a hundred times. If you watched it, you know what I'm talking about. That being said, so you have the image in your mind now. Let's continue. Now, Todd says that he you know, grabbed Amy, and he started to try to take her out of the building, but the rake kept, like, hitting stuff, obviously. I mean, it has a big handle on it. So he says he put her back down, he dislodged the rake, and then he scooped her back up, takes her to the truck. 
they hop in and they start heading to the hospital, at which point this is when they call 911. So 911 sends an ambulance that way, and they meet him halfway there, basically, and they exchange. He gives Amy them on the road. They continue on to the hospital. She's pronounced dead when she gets there. Now, later that same day, Todd is interviewed by the police, and during that interview, he basically is like, I don't know what happened to Amy. <clears throat> uh, now, he did admit that they have fought in the past, uh, and the police asked him to basically come in later and further explain the positioning of the corn rake and its four teens. Those are what I call the prongs on it. Now, when Todd explained that part, he said that he didn't think all of them were lodged in Amy when he removed it. So now let's get into like, the investigation part. So the investigator was Travis Hemsath, I believe. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. And he went to the autopsy. And so the medical examiner essentially said these injuries aren't consistent with what Todd's saying. And he was like, well, first of all, there's six puncture wounds and there's only four prongs or teens on this corn rake. Uh, and secondly, he said two of them are going in one direction, like upward, while other four are going in a different direction. So basically, it looks like, you know, one motion was done this way, then another motion was done this way. So it's not looking like she just fell down on the corn rake at this point. So now on November 16th, Todd was re-interviewed. And during this time, he told investigators that in 2013, that Amy had an affair with another man. And that it had devastated him, it broken any trust that he had with Amy, and he said that his oldest son had learned about the affair, and that he and his son grew closer because of it. And he also said that he never confronted Amy about this affair. Now that part I find very strange, because to me I'm just like, okay, well if your son was 13 at the time of the incident, that means he was even younger then. So somehow the son learned about this affair, Todd knew about the affair, but he doesn't talk to Amy, but he grows closer to his younger son over it. So that leads me to believe, and this is allegedly, because this is just me thinking, that he was, you know, having discussions about this with his kid. And I'm like, isn't that in really inappropriate? So that part was very odd to me that he said that. And again, we don't even know if that's true or if that's exactly what he meant. He just said that he grew closer to his son because of it. Now, eventually Todd admits that he did confront Amy about the affair. So he said that in July of 2018, that he found numerous correspondences between Amy and some guy that they both knew uh, when he was reviewing cell phone records. And Todd admitted that he confronted Amy, he confronted the man, and he confronted the man's wife. And that literally all of these people were like, no, they're not having a relationship. You know, this isn't a thing. You know, just chill. And Todd claims to the investigators, well, that put everything to rest, so on and so forth. Please hold. So... The investigators keep working the case and they, you know, more, you see when these people do this, because when stuff doesn't add up, this is where it's appropriate to keep digging. You know, when all signs point to some shadiness going on. So they keep digging and they learn that Amy did in fact have this affair uh, back in uh, 2018. So they meet the man that she had the affair with, and he says that, yeah, we've been having the affair all the way up until like the week of her death. And he said that uh, the man that she had the affair with told investigators that Amy had expressed to him numerous times that she wanted to leave Todd, but she was afraid. And that she even said that, look, if I disappear, you know that Todd had something to do with it. And, you know, that she was basically like, look, if we get found out, this is bad. And the guy even said, I was afraid for my safety if Todd were to find out for sure that we were having the affair. Now, also during that time, he said that Amy had told him that they couldn't text anymore because Todd was like reviewing cell phone records and things of this nature. Now, as the investigation continued, obviously they find out these little things like Todd and Amy hadn't slept in the bed for like, you know, half a year almost. Uh, her friends basically repeated the same type of stuff that, you know, Amy, even the day of the murder, Amy had texted one of her friends saying things were really tense at the house. And it, it just sounded like a horrible situation. So as the investigation continued, uh, they learned that Todd and Amy hadn't slept in the bed for like almost half a year. You know, they talked to her friends and they kind of confirmed the same type of stories that she was afraid for her safety. She was afraid to leave him. And, you know, she made it clear if something happens to me, you know to come looking for Todd. Now, apparently there was also a fear in there because I guess Amy had told some people about money she would get from a trust and like the farm and he was very afraid of this. Sounds like there's a lot of money at stake if a divorce happened or something of that nature. So all that being said, all that evidence, Todd obviously is rested and he has been held on a $5 million 
Bond. And he is getting ready to go to trial now. And I'm filming this Monday. The trial starts today. So hopefully I'll have this up by the end of today. And we're going to be following the trial here at the Sofa Squad, like we do every day, uh, and, and kind of get into it that way. Now, there's also going to be, and check this out, a podcast that Alan Reese from Toxic Bliss and I do. That is different content than is what's here in the videos. We're going to basically be dishing about the trial and kind of going over it that way, commentary, things of that nature. So if you're into that, there's going to be a link down in the description. Uh, you can find it on my website, which will be down there as well, but I'll put a direct link to like the podcast area that you can go to and check that out. So this should be interesting. Now, apparently his son's going to even be testifying at this trial uh, and it's going to be done in such a way where it's like, he's going to be in a different room on video and that type of stuff and not know his father seeing it and, and so on and so forth, you know, cause he's a, a young boy. Uh, so this will be really interesting. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Drop a comment if you want to. And other than that, I will see you soon. Nah.